The only way that we can achieve independence is by convincing some people who voted no back in 2014 to vote yes next time. And actually, the only way you do that is actually engaging with them, talking to them. It doesn't have to be on the doorstep, it can be on social media, it can be in the workplace. In my case, it tends to be in Aldi. It's going to go there every Friday. I just seem to, I don't know, it's a local one in my constituency, and I seem to do more business in Aldi than I do in the surgery, which is just one of those things. And I sense a change uh, to that extent. I genuinely do. The politicians, especially ones that are standing for particular parties, will always say that the wind's blowing in our direction now. But I would point to a couple of things. My uh, constituency has got very substantial levels of deprivation. Um, sometimes my colleagues in Glasgow are surprised. They, they can't even believe that Edinburgh's got any pockets of, uh, uh, you know, train spotting is an absolute revelation to people in the west of Scotland. And um, if you're from West of Hills, then it wasn't by much. But in my consistency, especially in Alawa, Tullibury and Southway, there's substantial deprivation. But there are also one or two areas which don't have that level of dep dep um, deprivation. So I live in Dollar, and next door is a village called Muckert. And also represent the Bridge of Allen and Dumblane. Now you can imagine these have been quite quite tough areas, both uh, for the Yes movement and for the SNP over the years. Although, you know, having won that they seat in 2007 with around less than 400 majority, then up to about 4,000, it's now over 7,000. But these areas are the areas where the Tories have come back. And yet, uh, at the European elections recently, we were canvassing in Muckert and in Dollar. And we had a quite astonishing response. And it was from some people that were willing to go um, and vote SNP, partly an absolute disgust of what uh, Boris Johnson was doing. Um, but people have had that faith, and we have to acknowledge, in 2014, people had that faith. They thought the UK was a stable democracy, an example to other countries around the world. They had faith in the UK institutions. And this had been so shaken, they were now willing to vote SNP. But there was a protest or for some other purpose. And more than that, they were willing to consider independence where previously they hadn't done it. Now that's anecdotal, and it's in two small villages in central Scotland. But in Dunblane, uh, also my consensus, we have almost every week a stall. Uh, and the stall, I mean, I've been on it many times, and you'll see often the same people going by with absolute disdain on their faces, not wanting to talk, absolutely disgusted with the fact you're even there in your garish yellow and black um, things with your notice board and your um, stickers. I'd love to turn away and over the last few weeks the number of people that previously have done that for years are talking to us and they're talking to us also about independence. So I think that shift is there but the fact is it's those people we have to get. There's no other way around this. Yes there will be a new uh, cohort of young people that come forward that never had a vote in 2014 of course that could change but we're going to have to give in some people that didn't vote yes last time to vote yes next time. And for those that want to have some kind of ideological purity about how we achieve it, well, that's not me. I know I believe in it. I'm a social democrat. I believe in the uh, programme of the SNP. I don't agree with every single policy the SNP has ever had, of course. But I believe in that. But that's not the truth for many other people. So we have to, when you talk to people, I think, and I discovered this prior to campaigning uh, in the independence referendum, I mentioned I got elected by a majority of four in by elections, so that means that there were almost half the population in Alva that didn't support me, didn't like me, didn't like the SAP very often. Uh, and I know them from that time, and I've represented them ever since, either in the council or in the parliament. And each time that the individuals have come to me that were vehemently against me at the start, just patiently listening to them seems to have converted a few of them, such that they now support either if not me, certainly SNP and independence. So, I mean, I know in my surgery, as far as a councillor or as an MSP, somebody coming in and ranting or sending me an email, but they can often be very offensive, abusive even. Uh, they don't seem to do that when they come face to face with you, I've noticed. Um, but the very fact that you've listened to what you've said, and if you can find some common ground. So, say, for example, somebody says, um, no, I couldn't support independence. Um, my son's in the wrong Navy. He would lose his job. It's a disaster. This kind of thing. And you start to say, well, usually it's um, sons in the army, and you start to ask them about how good the, especially in Edinburgh, the housing provision is if you're in the army, or if they've got a family, if they've enjoyed moving to three different countries and even their kids to three different education systems within the space of three or four years. 
or, for example, a lot of my former colleagues up in Fort Five Commando had to do three tours of Afghanistan, which in itself is either four or six months, but it's about a seven month uh, pre training period, during which you have to be away from your family. So the question is, it's all very well wanting a career, and it's quite horrible to want a career in the armed forces, but did you expect to be in the uh, front line of every dispute that was going on around the world, to be dragged into every uh, war at the behest often of the United States? Did you expect to be away from your family for that much length of time? So, and then they start to think twice about that. And also the ones in Afghanistan that were getting a P-45 handed to them when they were on the front line. Absolute disgrace. And it goes back even further to when they abolished all the Scottish regiments. Now I am no expert, I've spent a very short time in the military at the lowest level you can be, or because of my job as a veterans minister, I often met generals and all these kind of people, and they would say that, you know, after a few months. And what rank did you achieve? I said, well, I achieved the highest rank in the UK Armed Forces. And he said, what's that? He said, Marine First Class, you can't be better than that. And um, we stayed in life um, with all the pits on the shoulders. Um, but when you, um, when you confront people with what their experience of the armed forces um, is, then you can do things so much differently. So I, I mentioned just a point out how you can find a common ground with somebody that has a particular reason for opposing independence, which would be deeply felt and quite sincere, but you can't find that common ground. And I think, in my own view, is that's the only way to do it. I was on the door with somebody else in the SNP yesterday, and it was just so... You know, somebody said something which straight back in their face with a counter argument. And I, because some, that person felt very strongly, I'm just not convinced that's what works. It actually convinces people otherwise. I'll say a couple of words if I can on um, timing of an independence referendum, because that may be of interest, and there is no big revolution coming, by the way. Um, but I have to say, and I know there is criticism, I know we'll hear from other people that have got criticisms of it, that I think. The approach taken by Nicola Sturgeon has uh, borne fruit. So, say last year, I was just elected deputy leader last year, and the line from the SNP was we want Brexit to be resolved before we confront people with a further uh, big constitutional uh, issue. That was widely criticised, and the yes movement was defending it, kicking the can down the road, and so on. Uh, but I believed I thought that was true. But remember, last year we thought Brexit was going to be done by last October. That's what we were told by the UK. But if you look at how it's developed since then, um, and the absolute contortions of the UK state, I think it's worth it. And incidentally, on that particular point, we're waiting till Brexit, at least the prospects of Brexit are known. And by that is not meant waiting till the SNP or the Yes movement know what Brexit's going to entail. It's the people have an idea of what Brexit's going to entail. And I put exactly that there. I'm not saying that Castle Douglas is typical of the rest of Scotland. By any means, it, I've got a guy called Alistair Jack, we're still trying to find the guy, I said. <laughs> and it voted overwhelming no in the referendum. But what you could say is, at least I did yesterday in that short exchange, was people saying Brexit is so bad now, yeah, willing to think about it and talk about independence. And I've got a number of doors in succession. So I think there is a real point to that, waiting to see uh, what is resolved of that. My own view, and I've said this to Nicola, I've said it to anybody, I want to have a referendum before 2021, before the elections. And the reason for that, the main reason for that, partly I just want to have, we want to have independence since October uh, 1984 when I joined the SAP. But the other reason is because I think if you leave it beyond that, the danger is that Brexit becomes normalised. Especially if it's a no-deal. A no-deal is going to be absolutely horrendous. And I don't think even those that are politically active have got a sufficient awareness of how bad this is going to be. And I don't even think I have. But the government ministers that are working on the contingencies, and they know they can cover some things, but they can't cover it. It's going to be disastrous. But even with that, there can be, if you wait months and months after that, it becomes, it becomes uh, somewhat normalised to people. So that's why I think it's important that we have a referendum. Nicola Sturgeon said recently she would want to ask for Section 30 before the end of this year. She would uh, like to have a referendum uh, in the second half of next year. And I uh, like uh, that timetable. And I think, had we gone for a referendum last year, um, and I said at the time, and I said it to Nicola at the time, I think we would win. We would have won the referendum then. Like, you couldn't guarantee it, I'm not saying it was inevitable, but it was possible to win it then. People in Scotland, whether you like it or not, are relatively socially conservative. They like the idea of things like 
Uh, and you have to be socially conservative to like the rule of law, but they do like the fact that people play by the rules. And when they see the contempt with which the rules are being treated by the UK government, that all adds, I think, to some of the most um, propitious circumstances that we've had um, for independence. So I, I think it's closer now than it's been at any time for me in 35 years. I hope that we have the referendum soon. Um, I think many people will do that. I don't think it helps as much to be taking pot shots at each other. We have to convince one by one those people to come across to make it above 50%. And for those, um, and this is another issue which I'm sure will come up, and this will be the last point that I'll um, get for you. The issue of the Section 30 order. Now the Section 30 order, go back to the referendum in 2014. Certainly the Scottish Government at that time referred to it as the gold standard. And for other countries around the world, which is really important, they want to know it's a straightforward, clean, fair, democratic process, and that was. referendum. Now, what we have now is a different situation from 2012, where the SNP, by far and away, you know, <coughs> major party in the Scottish Parliament, outright majority, most of the resources and the personnel to uh, prosecute a campaign brought together the white paper uh, through the Scottish Parliament. They've got a different independence movement now. It's much more mature, it's in different places, it's different parties. And, and I'd be interested in finding out what people think about this. We may have discussed it this morning, we may discuss it shortly. I don't think it's possible to have that one unified offer. It's not very easily. So for the SNP, we've gone through a process, we've had our big debate on the Growth Commission, We've now got, with some amendments, we've got a fixed position on most of the economic and financial issues, currency included. We have a Commission on Social Justice which will help us put forward other positions on pensions. And that one about the Tories wanting to make people work to their 75 is a really good one to use in the doorstep, let me tell you. So the SNP will come to its position in due course. I'm not sure, and there are people here from the SSP and from the Greens, and I've had discussions with parliamentarians um, in the Greens and I've discussions with Colin Fox and Scottish Independence Convention, Scottish Independence Foundation, National Yes Registry. I'm not sure we will quickly come to an agreed position. And to the extent that we don't, we will just be slaughtered by our opponents. So it may be that we have a core position which talks about how we move to independence. The SNP will say what they would envisage if they were the government of independent Scotland. But others will say what their vision of an independent Scotland is, and maybe that is the way to do it. And believe it or not, and I'm not sure how many people in this audience will fall into this category, there are people on the right, not these business people, that will have a vision of what an independent Scotland could be for them. And that is perfectly legitimate for them to have that. And we should not preclude people from that side of Scottish society from coming in behind independence. But that's my view on it just now. I'll continue to have those negotiations. We meet again on... Wednesday night, the Scottish Independ Independence Convention here in uh, Edinburgh. Um, so it would be really useful to hear what uh, people here think. But from my point of view, we are closer than we've ever been. I know it's becoming a cliche now, but you can sense it. Um, if I had had this similar meeting in 1984, it would be me and two others uh, uh, and a cup of tea, and that would have been it. It was one of those ones where you join, in my case, a young student nationalist at the university and immediately become the treasurer, secretary campaign manager um, and things have changed pretty substantially since then so thanks very much for the invitation to come along and i look forward to any questions when the, we have the panel thank you